Hello, everyone, and welcome to the January 2021 edition of the Green Infrastructure, Climate, and Cities uh, seminar series. This is a monthly series focusing on the unique challenges that climate change poses for cities and what we can do about it. My name is Franco Montalto, and I'm a professor in Drexel's College of Engineering and one of the lead principal investigators on the Consortium for Climate Risks in the Urban Northeast. This is a NOAA-funded uh, team of researchers and universities that have been focusing since 2010 on the unique issues that our region faces with, in, with respect to climate change. Uh, we're extremely excited today to be able to offer this particular seminar in partnership with the Academy of Natural Sciences as part of the Environmental Justice Week. As we all know, environmental justice needs to be central in our efforts to adapt to and mit mitigate for the effects of climate change. And you're gonna hear various perspectives on this topic uh, today. We're also extremely pleased to promote this event as the first CC run seminar to be held during climate year, a period during which we are at Drexel celebrating, supporting and cataloging the ongoing climate and sustainability initiatives at all levels of our university and launching new ones. And you can see here our brand new climate year logo. And please, if you have not done so already, go to our climate and sustainability website and learn about some of the exciting things that are going on and will be going on over the next 12 months. CC Run began hosting this series in 2014. Uh, for those of you who are joining us for the first time, all of our seminars are live cast, they're recorded, and they're archived on the CC Run website. Every future edition of this seminar series is held on the first Wednesday of every month via Zoom and hopefully after COVID in person as well on our campus. Feel, feel, please feel free to go to the CC Run website uh, to watch any of our previous seminars there. For those of you interested in continuing education credits, those are available for attendance at today's session. Please email us and we will document your registration and attendance with a certificate. During the seminar, Please use the Q&A box to submit questions you wish to discuss with the speakers. Uh, you can also upvote questions that have been posed by others and raise your hand if you wish to ask a question orally. The chat should only be used for technical questions uh, and it may not be uh, accessed by those facilitating the questions. So today's topic is environmental justice in Philadelphia with a focus on the PES refinery. Here to introduce our speakers is the Sustainability Manager for Drexel Sustainable Water Resource Engineering Lab, Corinne Tangerkul. Thank you, Franco. And sorry, I think my cat has joined us. So sorry if she's meowing in the background. Um, before we start today's seminar, uh, one of our speakers, uh, Matt Walker from Clean Air Council, suggested something that we haven't done before in our seminar, seminar series, but that we are kicking off today and intend to do in seminars moving forward. And that is acknowledging the land that we currently occupy. For those in the Delaware River Basin, we occupy the historical homeland of the Lenape people. And um, I'm going to read some information with full credit to Matt and Clean Air Council for providing these words. 80% um, of Lenape died from violent conflict and disease within the first hundred years of foreign contact. And during the 18th and 19th centuries, many Lenape were forced to move west and north to areas of Ohio, Wisconsin, Oklahoma, and Ontario. Many bodies of water in our region retain Lenape names, such as the Susquehanna, Nakamixon, and the Wissahickon. Um, so we would just like to honor the historical and ongoing presence of the Lenape in this watershed, where we live, work, drink, fish, swim, and recreate. Um, and thanks again, uh, Matt, for that suggestion. To, to, so moving on to today's conversation, environmental justice in Philadelphia, the PES refinery. Uh, this is actually the first of a three month series on environmental justice. Um, in February and March, we'll be highlighting stories, um, environmental justice stories in Boston and in New York City. And in this mini series, we're particularly interested in learning from partnerships between environmental justice organizations and institutions to learn what has worked and what hasn't worked. Um, and in the spirit of learning from and improving upon what hasn't worked. Uh, I just want to acknowledge and recognize that the relationships between environmental justice organizations and institutions are fragile, they are imperfect, and sometimes interests don't align, timelines don't align, there's a lot that can go wrong, um, and it's a, a personal interest to me to learn where there is alignment 
and where there is opportunity to work together and to create positive relationships. Um, and I just want to mark that we've had extraordinary interest in this webinar. We've had um, record numbers of registration. So I think that many of us are eager um, to learn how to better support environmental justice communities. So we're very thrilled to have the speakers that we have with us today. Um, we're going to be starting off with Alexa Ross and Carol White um, from Philly Thrive. They joined together in 2015 with Philadelphians from all backgrounds to build Philly Thrive, a grassroots organization focused on winning back the right to breathe for all Philadelphians, starting with the largest oil refinery on the East Coast. Ms. Carroll has been a community leader in South Philadelphia for decades, and she's grown as a fierce advocate for environmental justice, watching family members and neighbors pass away from the refinery's pollution spewing in her backyard. Alexa has been organizing for climate justice for over 10 years, dedicating herself to the craft of base building, leadership development, and campaign strategy. The two met when Alexa knocked on Miss Carol's door, and ever since they have been cultivating a multiracial cross class organization rooted in the neighborhoods surrounding the former PES oil refinery. Philly Thrive organized direct actions and mobilized residents to stand foreclosure of the refinery following a massive explosion and declared victory in February 2020 when public pressure played a role in the refinery's permanent closure. After Q&A with Alexa and Ms. Carroll, we will move on to Matt Walker from Clean Air Council. Um, he is the advocacy director where he manages staff across Pennsylvania on campaigns to reduce air and water pollution from industrial infrastructure and advance environmental protections at the local, state, and federal level. Recently, Walker worked with partners to engage, uh, to engage stakeholders in envisioning the long-term future of the former South Philly refinery site. He holds a master's degree in urban and regional planning and has over 10 years of experience engaging communities on taking, on, on, sorry, on taking action to address environmental issues. Um, and then after Q&A with Matt, we'll move on to uh, Harris Steinberg, executive director of the Lindy Institute for Urban Innovation. He came to Drexel from the School of Design and, um, oh, sorry, from the School of Design at the University of Pennsylvania, where he was the founding director of Penn Praxis, the school's applied research arm. Since 2001, Penn Praxis has fostered faculty and student collaboration on real world projects in architecture, landscape architecture, city and regional planning, historic preservation, and fine arts. Some of his projects include the 2006 to 7 planning process for the Central Delaware River, which continues to guide development today, a 2008 study on reimagining the Kimmel Center, action plans to add to Philadelphia's park space and increase the vibrancy of Ben Franklin Parkway, the new Fairmount Park, a vision and action plan released last spring, and the revisioning PES refinery, re envisioning PES refinery report, which he will tell us about today. Um, then after Q&A with Harris, um, we'll hear again from Philly Thrive, and then we'll open it up to Q&A for all of our panelists together. Um, we are so delighted to have these speakers today, so I will now pass it off to Alexa and Carol from Philly Thrive. Awesome. Thank you so much. We're coming on through our cameras. We'll see if Ms. Carol. Yes, we've made it. Okay. okay. Um, I am sharing my screen with our presentation for today. Um, thank you so much for having us. Um, Ms. Carol, what do you think? Should we lead with a couple deep breaths in true Philly Thrive fashion? Yes, yes. You wanna lead I'll, us? Yes, I will, I will. This is one of my favorites. We like re relaxation time. We like everyone to take a deep breath, uh, take three deep breaths when I count to three. One, two, three. Thank you, everyone. I appreciate that for participation of everyone. This is what we do in the beginning of uh, each meeting and each time we come together is to make sure we have the right to breathe and we take that right to breathe. So that's why we take time out to breathe. Thank you. That's right. Um, and we're gonna get started with our agenda. So we've been asked to speak on kind of the legacy of the South Philly oil refinery, the founding of Philly Thrive and organizing milestones as we've been rallying together Philadelphians for our right to breathe. So it's a lot to cover in 15 minutes. So bear with us. Remember to keep breathing throughout the presentation. And we'll try, Ms. Carol and I will try to remind each other of that as well. Um, and with that, we will get into it. So the South Philadelphia oil refinery. 
So about 2014, when Ms. Carol and I started uh, beginning to form what would be Philly Thrive, this is kind of what the story looked like. Um, there was maybe, um, God bless them, the Clean Air Council folks or other environmental advocates um, popping up um, from time to time in city council, talking about the oil refinery. Um, but for such a massive development that's 1,300 acres, um, it's about twice the size of Center City, Philadelphia. It's like, I think about the size of Central Park and um, Arlington combined. Um, so it's a huge site. So when Miss Carol and I first met each other and Miss Carol living right near the refinery, which she'll tell you more about, the story was pretty quiet. And that was the first big challenge is to figure out why is no one talking about this? Um, the fact that the largest oil refinery on the East Coast is in Philadelphia, um, and what do we do about it? And it was was only after years of organizing and residents um, standing together, Miss Carol White and others in South Philly telling their stories that uh, just a few years later, the story was on the cover of the New York Times Magazine. So we wanted to just open with um, kind of that point about how history is not automatically written. Stories are not automatically told unless we organize together and support and lift up the voices of people who have, have not had their stories listened to. Um, so we wanted to lead off with that. Um, and I'm gonna pass it to Ms. Carroll in a second after kind of opening, opening the story of the South Philly refinery um, as one of, you know, of, of, about the extractive economy, that we can't look at the, the history of the oil refinery and its impact in Philly without understanding that it is part of a much bigger picture that we in Philly Thrive understand is the extractive economy. And two major pillars of that economy are fossil fuel extraction, fossil fuel use, and racism. And so a little bit of the history around the refinery, you know, it started operating as a site right after the Civil War. So right after the war that was contesting whether, um, you know, slavery uh, would be allowed, would be legal in this country. And just a few decades later, by 1891, it was producing half of the world's lighting fuel and um, exporting a third of, of the US's petroleum exports. And so, of course, in the 90s, we saw the, the thirst for oil, the really the oil economy um, that drove, forcibly drove the extraction and the consumption of oil in the US and worldwide really taking off. Um, and it was only in the 1920s that government began to realize we've got to actually monitor these, these facilities. We actually need, we need to start measuring them and start, start keeping track of releases that are occurring um, that are not legal. Um, and that brings us to, uh, yeah, and explosions were happening at that time, right? It was unsafe extracting fossil fuels, processing fossil fuels was, was dangerous from the beginning, even though in the beginning industrialists were a little bit more committed to efficiency because it was, it was in the best interest of their wallets and their profit. At some point um, that started slipping. And we saw, this is an article from the Inquirer in 1879 that documented a refinery fire back then. So from the jump, we saw this refinery and all fossil fuels causing damage to people and the planet from the beginning. Um, and Ms. Carol, do you want to jump in at this point around the next chapter of the, the refinery's history? Yes, um, yes, we can talk about in the 1960s and 70s with a great uh, migration increased black populations in Northeast cities and living in Jim Crow South, which white people had moved out when, when uh, African-Americans moved in. There, uh, it talked about how in 1934, where there were no loans that were up, but was actually um, handed out to the people that wanted to own their own homes. And it was hazardous at that time because of the residents and, and getting the loans and risk of segregation. Um, and they declared the, the, the refinery was a no place, the no red zone to even, red line zone to even mm -hmm. move it. So talk about public housing and around the refinery. We've got Tasker Home, Pasture Homes in Bartram Village in Wilson Park where I live. And it took out like a, an environmental justice late in the 1960s and 1980s. Most of the American uh, majority of environmental laws were passed, finally were passed. So we lived in that type of environment for a very, very long time. Um, I'm here now living right across the street from the refinery. So this is one section of everywhere when, where some Caucasians moved out and Blacks came in. 
Great. Yeah, so this is the big picture of this history on, we don't just look at, you know, the last decade of the refineries operations or the last few years. Um, this is a part of a much bigger story about how our society has been set up um, using the pillars of, of racism and classism to develop our energy economy. And this is the result. Um, the result is, you know, a massive oil refinery that um, was destroying residents' health. And as Ms. Carroll named, the different public housing developments, low-income housing that was built right around the refinery um, used to, you know, there was allegations against the public housing authority in Philly that they were really, you know, ghettoizing poor and Black people and surrounding them around this this really, really toxic site that only in these decades um, in the later half of the 20th century was it being realized how dangerous it really was and how damaging to people's health it really was. So this is just a glimpse of some of the health impacts that result from, from, this, from this current economy and this current society. Ms. Carroll, anything else you wanna say about the impacts of the refinery on people's well, health in the community? Yes, well, I, I actually have um, serious problems myself in the last explosion that happened um, in June. Um, and the people that died in my, in right around me, it was just, it's, it was devastating because I, it, it, it touched my heart. It touched my heart so much that my mother even passed from cancer. So a lot of cast, cancer, asthma, asthma and respiratory failure uh, from, from my neighbors, really from my neighbors in Wilson Park, because we're the closest. And, and, it, and it was a very, very, very bad time for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, Ms. Carroll. And we honor Philly Thrive in our work. We we honor, we try to honor moment to moment and day to day the people, um, the countless people. There aren't even the the records don't even exist to actually um, shed light to the true impact of the refinery. Here's on this slide, we have some really powerful um telling statistics about the refinery's impact from some of the health studies that were done. But we know air monitoring, you know, air monitoring regulation didn't even exist for so many years of the refinery's operation. Um, but, and for years, as, as Ms. Carroll and other Thrive members have been telling stories of the refinery's impact in the halls of city council, you know, mm -hmm. folks would be asked, can you prove it? Can you prove that the yeah. refinery is causing, you know, the cancer, the asthma? And so luckily, you know, Philly Thrive was able to rally together, you know, the folks like Clean Air Council, you know, Physicians for Social Responsibility to weave together the statistics that could tell the story. Um, but for so long, residents were not listened to and there was not the data to back up the impact of the largest polluter in Philadelphia and the true harm it was causing um, to the communities nearby. So Q Philly Thrive, um, here's a little bit about our story of, of where, we, where we came into the picture. Um, so this was back in 2014. I don't know if you all remember this at all, but plans started to surface on newspapers in Philly. Uh, you know, op-eds op were penned by fossil fuel executives, um, by politicians talking about turning Philadelphia into a quote unquote energy hub, which would have meant uh, expanding the South Philly oil refinery, increasing the amount of oil trains coming through Philadelphia, which is a whole other aspect of, of the refineries functioning. The fact that trains carrying extremely dangerous oil um, that, that could you know explode at any given moment. There were multiple derailments. So they wanted to expand that, that infrastructure um, and all for the promise of jobs and economic revitalization. There was that rosy story we're gonna see again and again as fossil fuel executives try to push um, these, these toxic and extractive um, energies on us is, is what can be gained. And so it was in the spring and summer of 2015 that Ms. Carol and I met you know, as Philadelphians started to actually speak to each other about, do you know about these energy hub plans, especially people living near the refinery? Have you heard this plan to expand the refinery? And that's when we started to really get together and, and realize that, um, yeah, that folks needed their leadership supported, needed, need, this story needed to come forward about, about the refinery. We were hearing just stories right away about asthma in every household, you know, about the, the fears and the worries of whenever the, when the next explosion was going to be at the refinery. Um, and so this is a little bit, some of the notes and pictures of, of the organizing we started to do just to begin to form the relationships um, that would lead to Philly Thrive. Um, 
Ms. Carol, you want to jump in here and talk about our, our launch and what we wanted to stand for from the beginning? Well, we talked about um, the Right to Breathe campaign and, and, and the healthy and safe over profit and no fossil fuels expansion and green economy for everybody. Uh, we, at our meetings, we always shared how, how the differences, how different will be that we can do these campaigns and be successful with it. Uh, the mm -hmm. campaign goal was to Philadelphia around the right to breathe, the window of uh, political support against the hub projects. So um, what we did with, at our meetings, I, I really enjoyed them because we actually got a chance to share one another's thoughts and how we build the campaign around the, the community yep. uh, and, and giving them more information than they ever had before. Yes. Mm -hmm. Awesome. And we have a couple principles in Philly Thrive. I don't know if you wanted to keep rolling here, Ms. Carroll, but that we saw a need, you know, in the environmental landscape in Philadelphia of the groups that were functioning at that time. Uh, we saw a, a need for more organizations to really come forward um, that, that believed in tactics of building people power and using nonviolent direct action. So knowing that advocacy strategies are vital, legal strategies are vital, but actually a, a, a crucial ingredient if we look at how change has been made across history has been people organizing together and actually putting the will of the people forward such that um, those in decision-making seats have to follow. Um, and actually using action tactics that aren't about us always asking decision makers, you know, will, will you do this, but actually taking bold and truthful action that puts decision makers in a dilemma about what is, what is right and wrong um, and if they will be on the, the right side of history. Um, and Thrive also wanted to really center this principle Ms. Carol was just talking about around being a true environmental justice organization that is centered in an understanding that we're not all impacted the same. We, we are all impacted in some way by climate change, by fossil fuel extraction, but it is not the same and that matters. That matters for the solutions that we pursue. It matters for the strategies that we build. Um, so that was vital to us um, from the beginning and to this day. Anything to say there, Ms. Carol, before we move on to our milestones, our campaigns, you wanna jump in there. You can go ahead, sweetheart. Okay. Mm -hmm. Awesome. So these are our campaign um, milestones. Go ahead, Ms. Carol. Okay. Um, Southport campaign stopping refinery expansion. I already was a good day that day. <laughs> Lots of door knocking and building leadership uh, and creating our own timeline for change. It, it was very, mm -hmm. it was very uh, interesting for me and my very first time to do the things that I've done as far as keeping myself on point. When we had to do different things, was going to different places and and actually um, stopping traffic and doing the things we've done to 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 get a to get noticed, you know. So that was very important to me. Um, and bringing out all our uh, all our community leaders and also being aware I can bring out my children, the youth, that they were very more important to me and my seniors. So I spoke out for my seniors and my youth. You know, that was very important for me to speak out for them. Awesome. Yep, so we, we had our first major mobilization at the ref, at the refinery gates where we had civil disobedience. We, we started having cookouts and using, continuing to use creative tactics to keep, um, keep people engaged in the campaign who, who live right next to the refinery, who were just starting to really understand the connection between the refinery and different struggles in, in, in their lives. Um, and so that campaign was one with, with work from, you know, partnership from folks like Clean Air Council and other environmental organizations. Um, and in, in 2017, the next campaign milestone, and we know we're right at 15 minutes, so we'll start, start wrapping up. We'll move through these milestones quickly, but um, the Dump Wells campaign was a chance for Philly Thrive to start working in a multi-issue coalition. So we know that environmental justice is not a single issue. Um, if we look at truly the environment from a standpoint of, of our homes, that encompasses everything. It encompasses economic justice, social justice. Um, and so we started banding together as Philly Thrive with with other organizations that weren't environmental. And we, we set our sights on um, Wells Fargo as a bank the city of Philadelphia was, was banking with that had ties to, to racist lending practices, to the, the Dakota Access Pipeline that indigenous folks in North Dakota were organizing against, and the PES refinery. So we were starting to make the connections um, in our organization and in, in for Philadelphians between 
these different social social justice issues. And we started to, to start to connect with the national climate movement and make sure that Philadelphians, this voice beginning to come out of Philly advocating for environmental justice was starting to connect with leadership of frontline communities across the country. So we went to, to DC and that's Miss Carol's, Ms. Carol's grandson speaking to the press there in DC at the climate march. Um, Ms. Carol, you wanna talk about the We Decide campaign a little bit? You, you can finish. You're doing a very good job, Alexa. But you <laughs> let this. Okay. Ms. Carol's surveying residents um, here in our 2017 campaign. It was the first time we actually stepped up to intervene in the city's process of planning our energy future. We were notified, okay, the city is, is laying out a longer term plan for our energy system. And there's doesn't seem to be any kind of approach to actually engaging residents who have been most impacted um, by the energy system. And so that's our role. Philly Thrive stepped in. We developed a survey. Talk a little bit about the survey and what we did with it, Ms. Carroll. Well, it was very good. I, I actually, we canvassed a lot. We canvassed a lot of homes. We did a uh, door to door knocking. Uh, we explained to a lot of people to come out and sign up so that anytime they can go to phillythrive.org, they can find more information about the uh, campaign and, and what we're doing in the, in, the, in the area. So we had a, a very good time out there that day. Um, the com committee person, uh, um, Harris and, and Jordan, they gave mm -hmm. a, a nice big uh, out, out thing for the block party for the children and, and everyone, the officers were out there, different organizations were out there. And we got a very, very good turnout with, um, with signing, our, our signing our petition, very good day. Yep, and so this was a big victory because the way we in Philly Thrive approach change making is that we think about the pillars that hold up the refinery and we were beginning to see if we could remove support uh, one by one of each of the pillars and the city was one of the key pillars that was allowing the refinery to keep functioning and so we won a big victory with this campaign, getting the mayor's office of sustainability to admit We've got to transition the refinery. No one had been talking at the political level much at all about the refinery and Philly Thrive really made sure that um, that was a key statement in this in this energy um, planning report that the refinery needed to be transitioned um, in order to stop polluting surrounding communities. Um, so our Pay Up PS campaign pursued reparations from, from the refinery for, that was a key thing that folks wanted from the beginning when we started organizing is reparations for all the harm that's been done. Philly Thrive started banding together with a coalition called the Alliance for Just Philadelphia to fight new fossil fuel projects that were cropping up. Together, we organized the largest um, at-large city council forum to together as, as 60 uh, grassroots organizations to bring our demands to all of the folks who are running for seats in city council and make them respond to our demands together instead of each of us one by one approaching city council. We stood together and made sure that the refinery was part of the key issues. Um, so again, we're just, all these campaigns are kind of chipping away at the refinery's power at each of the supports um, that was keep allowing the refinery to continue to function. And after the years of those campaigns, it was, you know, when Ms. Carroll talked about the explosion in June 2019 that could have killed everyone in Philadelphia. Yeah. Philly Thrive had was well positioned to step into the, the national media spotlight that was looking finally, finally looking at the South Philly oil refinery to tell the stories of not only just that explosion, but the long term, the generations long impact the refinery had been causing. And we were able to really plan direct action after direct action to stand for permanent refinery closure and um, are very, very happy to announce that, you know, in February of 2020, the refinery was was sold to a company that would would put the land to a new use. Um, and we truly believe that we've, we found ways to influence a, a very closed door process through the tactics of direct action and people power by using disruption um, to make sure that decision makers were not going to just be left alone to make the decision about um, what would happen with the refinery going forward. Um, so I think that is our is our story and thank you for listening. Um, we'll be back later to share about what what's up next. Um, what is what is this new campaign that's about actually repairing the, the 154 years of harm done from the refineries pollution um, and we would love to have you all join us in that campaign. Thank you.
Excellent. Thank you, Alexa and Ms. Carroll. Really appreciate it. I do see uh, as we transition um, to having Matt come on from Clean Air Council, I do see a question in the um, Q&A about site remediation, but I'm actually going to hold that question because it might be addressed in um, the upcoming presentation. So I'm just going to hold to that, hold that one. Um, but I do see um, a hand by Jeanette Miller. So Jeanette, if you wanted to ask a question, um, I am going to allow you to talk and you can unmute yourself and talk if you had a question. Hey, Miss Jeanette, this is a, a fellow Philly thriver. Okay, gotcha. Um, she might have just wanted to raise her. Oh, I see you're unmuted now. I'm unmuted. We can hear you, Miss Jeanette. Hi, Miss okay. Jeanette. I wanted to ask, um, I did want to ask a question. I think I forgot it now, but what what have um speaking of the Hillco um company over there um that just bought um refinery. Or oh, they still have connections with with Chicago, and, and which way are they? Or was just Philadelphia, and what other surrounding neighborhoods, or uh, what other cities do we have the refineries? Mm -hmm. I'm not the refineries, Hillco. Yeah, definitely. Thanks, Ms. Jeanette. Yeah, so Ms. Jeanette already just, just told y'all that Hilco Redevelopment Partners is the company that um, purchased the refinery site and is redeveloping it. And um, as Ms. Jeanette just mentioned, uh, Hilco, is, it, they're a, a global real estate company with developments all across the, the world. Um, and one development in particular we've been learning from has been uh, Hilco's project in Chicago, um, turning a similar heavily polluted site into uh, warehousing and logistics, which is what their plan is to do here in Philly. Um, and we are learning, we are looking into all the other places that Hilco is operating because we love to connect with communities who are, um, who we have this, this similar company that we are dealing with to learn from, learn from what their experience has been um, to join together. Um, so that's, yeah, we're really looking forward to making more connections with communities who are also uh, dealing with Hilco um, as a neighbor. Excellent. Thank you. And we'll definitely be getting more into that as we go. So let's pass it on to Matt and we'll be hearing more from Philly Thrive before we move into Q&A. Um, so Matt, I pass the floor on to you. Okay, getting set up here. Thanks so much. And uh, thank you to Philly Fry for that excellent presentation and setting up the context uh, for, for all this work and, um, and, and for all of your tireless efforts and campaigns on this issue. It's been um, just really a game changer. Um, so I'm Matt Walker, I'm the Advocacy Director of Clean Air Council. Clean Air Council is an environmental health uh, nonprofit organization. We've been fighting to protect everyone's right uh, to a healthy environment since 1967. Uh, we use a variety of, um, of approaches to solving environmental issues. Uh, so we, you know, we have a team of um, about 25 people. We have educators, organizers, policy advocates, planners, engineers and lawyers, and we try to look at issues uh, from sort of a 360 degree view and uh, figure out um, how, to, how to best address them. And, and we have, um, we always uh, have the perspective of wanting to listen to an affected community to see what, uh, what their goals are and try to support uh, them in, you know, in achieving those uh, with whatever support we could provide. Uh, we have about 35,000 members across Pennsylvania we're headquartered in, in Philadelphia, but we do have offices in both Wilmington, Delaware, and Pittsburgh. So just a quick, um, quick summary of our work on the refinery. Uh, in this presentation, I'll be highlighting uh, the work that we've done in, in recent years on 
uh, remediation and visioning. Uh, but for some context, I, I wanted to highlight that the council uh, has worked on the refinery for, for a number of years uh, in different ways. Uh, back in uh, 2012, when PS took over the refinery from Sunoco, uh, the Clean Air Council filed a lawsuit to ensure that the um, various agencies, including DEP, uh, didn't allow PS to emit more air pollution, uh, specifically uh, oxides of nitrogen or NOx, which is a, a, a smog or ozone precursor, uh, to emit more of that than they should be allowed to given their permit. Um, don't quote me on it, but I think it was around 75 tons extra per year of NOx, uh, which is, is pretty significant, but they were trying to uh, pollute extra uh, by counting uh, the shutdown of the Marcus Hook refinery uh, in their permitting scheme. Uh, so we put a stop to that, thankfully. Um, in recent years, we've also uh, advocated for some fence line monitoring, uh, but this is before EPA made it a requirement uh, with their fence line monitoring rule. Uh, so asking air management services, which is the part of the health department in Philadelphia that uh, is in charge of ensuring uh, proper enforcement of the Clean Air Act uh, for sources in Philadelphia, we asked them to uh, you know, require benzene monitoring around the refinery. Uh, we were also involved in the energy hub, uh, opposing the energy hub concept that Philly Thrive talked about and participated in uh, various rallies and press conferences and direct actions related to that. Uh, you know, we were in City Hall testifying, um, all that, all that good stuff. Uh, we also did a, uh, a small listening project in uh, South Philly, Southwest Philly, to try to understand um, what people's concerns were around the refinery and kind of just uh, get an understanding of that for our organization. Um, and then we did uh, in, in the last year or two, uh, really after, after the explosion happened, uh, we did a bit of policy advocacy um, around trying to trying to get uh, some better use at the site and trying to prevent uh, another refinery from, from being built or, or reopened there. Uh, we've worked extensively on the remediation or cleanup process in, in the last uh, year or so, and um, also uh, co-led a, a long-term visioning process. And those two, the remediation and the visioning process will be uh, sort of what I'll dive uh, most into during this presentation. Um, so first, some of our policy advocacy work, uh, we worked on convincing city council to unanimously pass um, a resolution that called for the future uses of the refinery site to be protective of the environment um, and, and protective of public health. And, and we think that helped send a strong message to both potential bidders that were looking at purchasing the site uh, and also probably to the bankruptcy judge, uh, Judge Gross, who was looking uh, looking at this issue and had to ultimately make a decision around who, who would purchase the, the refinery. Um, we also, along with partners uh, such as Philly Thrive um, and others, convinced the city of Philadelphia from just assuming that the site after the explosion would just continue to be another refinery to being a lot more open to alternative uses and broader possibilities. A lot of their language in the first months after the explosion uh, were, were about assuming the site would be a refinery. Again, it would always be a refinery. And that changed substantially in written and oral communications um, and it's, it's documented in some of the reports the city put out. Uh, so I think that was a big win for, uh, for the movement. Um, Clean Air Council and Philly Five and others also succeeded in, in pressuring um, Evergreen, which is the uh, Evergreen Resources, is the subsidiary of Sunoco, who's responsible for the remediation. Uh, we convinced them to reopen the comment period on remediation documents that had actually already been approved by DP. Um, as, as part of that new process, Evergreen developed uh, a revised public involvement plan to, to include the required public meetings and uh, input opportunities, such as comment periods, which were in, in one now. Uh, and then a Clean Air Council also advocated for a bill that would ban the, the use and storage of, of hydrofluoric acid uh, within the city. And hydrofluoric acid, it's a very dangerous and harmful chemical that refineries use as a catalyst to create high octane fuel. And it, it could have 
uh, we were, it was a near miss when the, when the explosion happened. Um, there, there's a little bit of um, disagreement about what what exactly happened and if hydrofluoric acid was in fact um, part of this, but it could have we know that it could have made the explosion much worse than it was, uh, a lot worse. And um, shortly after some of this advocacy, the mayor's office introduced uh, a bill for the ban and uh, their own version of it, and city council passed it. Okay, so remediation. First, what is remediation? Uh, it's a cleaning up of, of contaminated land and water uh, to meet certain environmental standards. Uh, in, in the case of Pennsylvania, uh, we have um, specific requirements in a regulation called Act Two. And um, in the case of the refinery, this really means, uh, it, it could mean a variety of things. It could mean removing contaminated soil, uh, pumping and treating groundwater that's been contaminated. Uh, it, it could mean also covering a site over with, with asphalt. Um, and it usually uh, always includes monitoring um, of, of various uh, equipment and, and pieces of, of the remediation. So a little bit of background on, um, on the remediation. So Evergreen Resources, I, I mentioned a subsidiary of Sunoco, they're responsible for not only uh, the, the remediation itself, but investigating the soil and groundwater contamination at the site. And that's what's happening right now during this comment period. And that's really important in figuring out how much, uh, how much needs to be cleaned up and exactly where. Uh, they now have, uh, as a result of a new agreement, till the end of 2030 to complete the cleanup. And they prepared a bunch of extensive technical reports uh, years ago, um, three, three to, uh, to more years ago, uh, without, uh, without first getting any public input. And as I mentioned, DP approved those uh, before we uh, convinced, along with partners, Evergreen to reopen the comment period. A quick note that remediation is actually already happening at the site and has been for a number of years, um, uh, especially with groundwater remediation. It's currently going on with uh, things like filters and other, other equipment at the site. So there, there are just a whole slew, there's a whole long laundry list of, of chemicals, pollutants at the site. Uh, to be worried about, these are just a few, and I'll just, I'm just gonna highlight uh, lead, um, which you know is a, a toxic heavy metal and has uh, just a, a bunch of um, developmental and, and um, other health effects uh, that are very damaging to the human body. Um, and also PFAS, which has been in the news uh, in recent years more, uh, which stands for per and polyfluoroalkyl substances. Uh, these are a bunch of chemicals that are usually found in firefighting foams uh, and also some con consumer goods like uh, coated uh, cooking pans and things like that. Uh, but these chemicals are, so they're man-made, they can accumulate in the environment uh, and, and in the human body uh, and are, are harmful. Um, and um, let's see here. Yeah, there's a, there's a whole, I, I, won't, I won't read you off the whole long list of health effects, but uh, the Peter Council does have a fact sheet. If you want to learn more on our website, you can, you can go there to learn about all the health effects. Um, so some sources of pollutants at the site uh, that are responsible for the contamination include uh, pits that were used historically for toxic waste that included lead, uh, which are essentially, you know, what, what it sounds like, big open um, holes in the ground where, where this stuff was dumped. Uh, tanks that may have corroded over time. Uh, my understanding is some tanks were on donut-shaped pads and uh, as they corroded, uh, the contents and the fuel, which included lead, would, uh, would go into the ground. And then various spills over time at the site as well. Uh, so Evergreen is required to submit a, a whole bunch of plans uh, in this process. When we, when we talk about remediation, you think of, okay, how are they going to clean it up? Um, that's, that's one part of their plan and sort of a later one. Uh, first, they have to notify uh, the city and other actors that they're going to clean up the, the land. They did that. Um, right now, they're doing the remedial investigation report, so this environmental investigation of the contamination of the site. Uh, they've also done one risk assessment for lead, which we'll get to, um, and they may do more. 
then after that, after that's approved, uh, they can they can move forward with the cleanup plan and then issue a final report. So the remedial investigation report or the RIR, uh, this is what is open for comment right now. These reports are supposed to identify um, the technical term is the, the nature and extent of the contaminants in the soil. Um, and also where the, the fate of transport, where is the groundwater, the pollutants in the groundwater going and model uh, where the pollution is likely to end up. Uh, so consultants um, in Evergreen, in this case, uh, gets to select the number and location of the soil uh, and groundwater samples and, and monitor those samples. Uh, these investigation reports are reviewed and approved by DEP. Uh, I want to mention that the state uh, has health standards for, for remediation. These are based, um, these are in the, the Pennsylvania regulations called Act 2. Um, and they include standards for lead and other pollutants in uh, non-residential uh, soil um, and, and residential as well. Um, and also standards for groundwater uh, in, in non-residential aquifers or groundwater. Um, company, if a company can't attain these standards, then it can attempt to apply for and justify what's called a site-specific standard which is based on the nature of the site. Uh, and they have, and that's what Evergreen has done in this instance. So what do we do on remediation? Uh, our lawyers and engineers looked at hundreds of documents, uh, all these reports, and there's actually 20 reports we read through in a risk assessment, uh, thousands of pages. And um, our attorney that worked on this um, wrote up a 150 page comment uh, so far at least. Um, so it's a pretty, pretty extensive and far-reaching comment. We, we checked Evergreen's assumptions about how they arrived at their standards and their calculations. Uh, we, we put them into the modeling and kind of ran them and saw um, some differences for what Evergreen's proposing as to what we got. Um, we, we did public education. Uh, we held a workshop uh, in partnership with Philly Thrive. We put out a fact sheet and held some phone calls uh, with groups to kind of talk through the issues. We also met with city and state officials um, and, and actually EPA officials too, to, uh, to discuss these issues and to try to get that comment period reopened. So some of the, there, there's a lot of major issues with the investigation. We think the reports are not complete. They're flawed uh, for a number of different reasons. And uh, we have a chance now to strengthen that. Uh, we think the flaws are so bad that, that really substantial revisions are needed to, to kind of get this right. And that's really important. And we do think Evergreen needs to redo uh, their, their reports and, and open up another comment period. Uh, so one issue is um, the lead in, in surface soil. And Evergreen's proposed site-specific standard, remember, they, they, can, they can do that uh, if they justify it, is um, for the amount of lead permitted in soil at the site is more than twice the statewide health standards for lead, more than twice. Uh, this would not be protective of public health. It, it doesn't use a uh, what's called a target blood lead level, how much lead should be in, in blood uh, that's used by the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control. Uh, if it used that, it would have the appropriate uh, standard. If, if Evergreen was allowed to do this, then it would it would allow regulatory agencies to require Evergreen to, to address lead contamination on, on only a smaller a small fraction of the site uh, compared to what Evergreen would have to do with, with this higher standard. So it has uh, major implications as to where when, when Evergreen says this is how much, this is how many places lead is exceeding this standard, that standard is critical in identifying where on the site has to be cleaned up. We also think there was a, an insufficient analysis of the aquifers, both the shallow, there's a shallow and a deep aquifer, so groundwater under the site. Um, it's, the shallow groundwater is particularly high in some areas of the, the site. Um, the, the water table, they call it, the top of the shallow groundwater, is uh, in some places less, uh, less than uh, 10 feet from the surface. Um, Evergreen's standard does not uh, take the health risks of exposure to groundwater into account. Um, the groundwater might be polluted by lead in the soil, 
And this is especially concerning and, and pertinent because the deep groundwater is a source of drinking water in New Jersey. And years ago, DP actually dis disapproved a report from Evergreen uh, on, on deep groundwater, in part because the Evergreen did not do this evaluation that's needed uh, to, to show um, what might happen uh, from pollutants like lead going through the groundwater. And is that an exposure route for people drinking water in New Jersey, for instance? Evergreen's also trying to fragment their investigation by uh, delaying an analysis of, of this very issue to a future report um, that they're saying would be made available later this year, at the end of the year. Um, but the current work can't really be evaluated until an analysis about the, those aquifers is, is complete. So they're asking us to do, you know, make a comment now, but we don't have all the work uh, shown. And this may, uh, may allow Evergreen um, to, to later say, we've already had a chance to comment on this issue. You can't comment on that anymore. So that's, that's a concern we have. Uh, climate change is another um, big issue. We're seeing uh, the effects of climate change more and more, uh, including in Pennsylvania and Philadelphia, storm surges, uh, you know, wetter, bigger, more frequent storms. The Schuylkill River could uh, have sea level rise up to two feet by 2050. And these impacts are absolutely important for figuring out what the extent of contamination is going to look like at this site. And so we need to ask questions like, what are the impacts of widespread lead contamination in soil uh, when you have flooding on the site, you have uh, the site uh, inundated underwater um, in, by 2050. What does that look like? What does that mean in terms of where this pollution is going? And EPA actually has a policy of considering climate change impacts in cleanups of sites like this. And, and so we're pushing uh, Evergreen to do this. And Evergreen is also trying to fragment the discussion about climate impacts into a further, a later report uh, this year as well. Uh, the other issue, another big issue is that the investigation didn't include PFAS, uh, which we spoke about before, um, you know, these chemicals used in firefighting. So, um, and we talked about, well, the, the health effects of PFAS being uh, developmental effects in cancer or some. Um, so since the refinery has a history of catastrophic fires, it's important that Evergreen revises its reports to include PFAS. It has not included those uh, as, as of now. And DP is also expected to finalize a, a standard for PFAS in uh, these cleanups um, for, for industrial sites like this. And so DP should also make uh, this you know, PFAS a requirement for the investigation at the refinery site. So um, if you want to take action on, on this issue, you're in luck, but your time is running out. Uh, the comment period closes tomorrow, the 14th, um, and you can submit a comment uh, a, a number of ways. Um, Mayor Council has an action page, a template form you can fill out on the website there. It's just cleanair.org slash Philly Refinery. Or if you want to directly email Evergreen, the email address is, is right there. Um, yeah, you know, residents around the refinery, uh, as as Ms. Carroll spoke about, have, have suffered long enough uh, from the site and, and deserve environmental justice. Um, we need we need to hold Evergreen accountable and make sure the public health is the top priority during the cleanup. And there's no excuses for doing otherwise. I'm going to talk a little bit about our visioning work and sort of the process and then um, pass it off to Harris to talk about uh, the, the details of that. So um, we set out to um, we set out to do some visioning with a, a couple of goals in mind. Um, we partnered with the Lindy in Institute at Drexel to come up with a, an independent visualization of different design concepts for the site uh, for long term future uses that would align with the values of people involved in this process, uh, which in, in terms of uh, Clean Air Council's perspective, this meant uses that did not pollute the air or water uh, or do not negatively affect public health. Um, we also wanted to convince decision makers to adopt policies that advance the vision once, once our report was put out. Um, and you know, the, the, 
I mentioned before, the city seemed to assume the site would continue to be a refinery. Uh, and there was a, a uh, group put together, the uh, uh, refinery advisory group put together by the city to, to look at this issue. Uh, but we really felt that it was important to have an independent analysis uh, with, with all the stakeholders involved to really show uh, what, you know, what people uh, and organizations in the city of Philadelphia thought should be happening at the site in the future. So we put together an advisory panel, uh, which included nearby residents and groups, environmental groups, planners, academics, uh, a, whole, a whole bunch of important stakeholders. Uh, so it's, it was 50 members at the end of it. We had two visioning meetings with that panel um, and, and the panel members of the panel were invited to two other, um, two other visioning events as well, which I'll mention in a minute. We also had a public input workshop at Smith Playground South Philly, uh, where we talked about uh, some, some short and long-term concerns people might have around the refinery. We had about 35 people in attendance. Uh, the discussion was, was around public health, uh, safety concerns, and concerns around contamination, uh, sea level rise, what does sea level rise mean about the future, what future uses could happen at the site. Um, fears about gentrification and neighborhood changes that might not be positive uh, if you know if, if there's a future use and development that happens around the site so how do we address those concerns as part of the, the workshop we we asked for input on how people were prioritizing um, both different advocacy things we should be asking for uh, from from uh, city council and otherwise and also um, input on uh, greatest concerns about remediation um, you can see here are some uh, little stickers people are voting with. Uh, some of the, the biggest concerns are about groundwater contamination and, and the cleanup standards. We also distributed a survey uh, with three questions about the future uses. And you can see this all in the report. Uh, we did outreach to the registered community organi organizations or RCOs. We hired people in South Philly to collect some hard copy responses. We got um, a little over 350 responses, and it was a combination uh, electronic. It was 307 electronic surveys uh, filled out and uh, 59 written surveys, hard copy. Um, and we got a total response from zip codes around the refinery. About a third of all respondents uh, were from around the refinery. Uh, here are the results, um, seven themes came to the top um, and the majority, uh, the, the top ones, I should say, 47% uh, talked about wanting access to green space trees, 30 or 38% wanted walkability or bikeability. And then there's a bunch of other um, desires as well. Uh, Lindy organized a two day uh, design workshop called a charrette uh, to help create these visuals for what the future of the site could look like. Um, and this was based on a briefing book they put together that included, um, first and foremost, the survey results so they can see what people were saying, um, a look at the values we talked about at our um, advisory panel workshops and some of the preliminary meetings that we had with, uh, with stakeholders, um, and also land use and environmental maps about uh, sea level rise and that sort of thing. Um, and, and some case studies about the, the reuse of toxic industrial sites. So there's a two, two day workshop included ur urban designers, planners, and architects. And um, the participants use all that information to figure out several phases of development uh, for the site over, over the long term. Uh, we're looking out about 50 years. We presented the, the sketches from that workshop to the advisory panel at the end of it, the shred, and um, and got some feedback on that. And then we gave a formal presentation to the advisory panel um, and got feedback at a, at a February meeting. And this is uh, these these drawings were cleaned up a little bit at this point. Uh, and then after that, uh, they were cleaned up even more and sort of digitized um, and put into the this report. Um, and and we we released this um to the to the public and it really looks at the opportunities for for a vision that uh protects the environment and health uh, while also uh looking at how how do we spur economic development and and have high paying uh, union jobs uh, at the site 
So we were asked to talk about what worked and what didn't about the process. Um, so a few notes here on uh, what worked well. Um, I think hiring residents from the community to collect survey responses worked well. And um, I, I'd wanna do more of that next time. I think, you know, third respondents uh, from the area is is pretty pretty decent, um, but I think we, we could do better there as well. Um, given given the interest from the rest of the city, I mean the city was this is a citywide um, issue that lots of people were concerned about. Uh, so um, that's why I say I think a third is is decent. Um, I think some of the preliminary meetings we had with community groups and and labor to kind of better understand what they were concerned about and get feedback on the process. I think that was helpful. In, in sort of understanding where the conversation might go. Um, and, and also um, eventually, and I'll get to this in a second, I think seeking in, input from local groups like Thrive on, on decisions um, that they're, they're sort of in the best position to make on event location, scheduling and things along those lines. Um, I think at the end of the day though, the, the, the whole project, it was, it was important uh, start or, or spark, as, as my boss, Joe Minot, likes to, likes to call it, uh, a spark for this larger conversation on the future of the site. Um, and it was between people with very different perspectives and goals uh, in the same room, kind of hashing this out. And I think it was an important conversation to be had. Areas where we could, could improve this process. Um, there was a lot of conversation at the meetings about the short term versus the long term vision. And um, and, and there were, you know, people, especially the community groups and, and residents from the community wanted to make sure we were focusing on things, the here and the now, and things that can improve lives right now, uh, such as the remediation process or, or other issues that people had that they're, that they're bringing up. Um, and this is important uh, to not only look at what's in the long term and kind of do this uh, somewhat, um, you know, academic exercise about what the future it looked like, but how do we also address concerns right here and right now? So that was something that came up and we tried to address it in, in the report by putting in um, short-term phased approaches that, that could be taken in the next uh, you know, five or, or 10 years. Now we had a short time frame based on the grant funding. Uh, this was a, a William Penn funded project, but we had um, a very short amount of time to, to complete it in. And, um, and so that, that sort of condensed the, the input process um, a, a bit. And uh, COVID-19 uh, prevented us from having our, our large community workshop that we wanted to have at a local school. We'd already scheduled it and booked it and then uh, had to cancel it um, kind of last minute, right when the pandemic was, was starting to get really bad. Um, and, and so uh, that, that, never, that never happened, which was unfortunate. Um, in the future, we wanna to try to find some early agreement about project decision-making. Uh, yeah, I think there, uh, there was some frustration over parts of the process, like the number of participants per group that were um, were allowed to be represented on the advisory panel. We had two, uh, and some wanted more. That that's sort of an example that came to my mind. Um, I think, like I said, the fast timeline kind of probably exacerbated some of the process concerns. But we did try to get um, pretty substantial feedback on the process very early on, um, especially from community groups, um, and then. And then, like I said before, uh, getting in the future, getting more surveys and responses from the affected zip codes would be would be ideal. So next steps on visioning, and then I'll turn it over to, to Harris. Um, we want to. We've been talking to Philly Five about uh, discussing once the comment period for the remediation is over after tomorrow. We'll be talking a little bit about um, what what could the future visioning work look like, and how do we best center the affected community in that work going forward. Um, how do we take a deeper look at what could be accomplished in the short term, say the next five years or so? What are those priorities and how do we accomplish that? I'll take questions. Excellent, thank you, Matt. Um, for the sake of time, we do have a lot of questions coming in, but I'm just gonna um, take one from the Q&A box and I see also William Malloy has his hand raised. So I'm just gonna take those two questions. Um, and then Matt, if you get a chance to answer any of these, um, by typing out the answer, um, you're welcome to do that, or we can save them um, and try to answer some of them in the Q&A at the end. Um, and just a reminder for our audience to please put your questions in the Q&A box, not the chat. Um, it just helps us organize the questions coming in. Um, so, um, so Matt, would delaying Evergreen's report 
for uncontamination be better uh, so that the Biden administration has time to revoke Trump's EPA changes? Sorry, you cut out uh, there in the middle of that. Can you state that oh. again? <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, would delaying Evergreen's report on contamination be better so that the Biden administration has time to revoke Trump's EPA changes? Hmm. Um, I mean, we're not sure about that. Um, we, we're looking more at the reports themselves and the fact that they're inadequate and that they need to, you know, redo them. I think um, a, lot of, a lot of what's in the requirements that we're looking at right now are, are really with the state. Um, although they do use guidance and numbers from EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, from the Centers for Disease Control. Uh, so, you know, if there, yeah, if there were, you know, latest science that came out and, and showed that there should be a lower target blood lead level, for instance, you know, all of that could be helpful. Uh, but I think um, one thing I didn't mention, but it sort of relates to this, is that DEP, again, the Department of Environmental Protection in Pennsylvania, they recently proposed to increase their lead in soil standard, um, these statewide standards for non-residential sites to about what Evergreen was proposing, so making it less stringent. Uh, there, were, there was a pretty big public backlash against that proposal, and it seems like DP is not going to go forward with that. They're going to maintain their lower standard uh, for lead, which is, which is great. And I think that's where you know, a lot of the regulations we're looking at are, are with the state, although there is overlap with federal EPA regulations as well. Mm. And I'm just going to take a quick question from the audience. William, William I've um, unmuted you. So if you want to ask your question, please go ahead. OK, I, I was thinking about the uh, short term and long term goals. Uh, just to comment that sometimes in planning initiatives, uh, they have such a long time frame, maybe 50 years, that if the public doesn't see progress in the short term, they may uh, lose interest and, and support and they're uh, really give up their support for the for the goal the long term goals. It's just a comment. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, and that that was you know I, I think it was uh, it was definitely raised that we we need to do both. We need to have uh, what's going to happen in the next five years, and also what could this look like in the next fifty years. Great, so let's um, move on to Harris. We'll be coming back to Q&A at the end of the session. So we'll um, have more time to ask Matt questions as well as all the other panelists. Um, Matt, if you wanna stop sharing, I'm gonna put um, Harris's slides up and then I can pass the floor off to Harris. All right, good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you to Corin and Franco for inviting uh, me to this panel and for putting together what is really a, a fascinating, I think, an important conversation uh, with Thrive, the Clean Air Council, and, uh, uh, and the folks who are participating. Uh, I'm Harris Steinberg. I run the Lindy Institute for Urban Innovation at Drexel University. Uh, it's a provostial initiative that has the capacity to pull from all of the schools and centers at the university to solve big, hairy urban problems. And in many ways, uh, what could be bigger and hairier and more urban than imagining the future of the PES refinery? Uh, we've been interested in this site for a number of years, going back at least um, eight years ago when uh, PES sort of bought, purchased the site, when Sunoco sold it, and it, was, uh, it became the, ultimately the Philadelphia Energy Solutions site. Philadelphia Industrial Development Corporation at the time was doing a plan for the Lower Schuylkill and we were advising them, uh, helping to advise them through the process. And at that point, it was, wasn't clear whether or not this would be a oil refinery in the future or not. It, it, it of course, did become a state of refinery. It was um, upgraded for the Bakken Shale, as Alexa talked about. Uh, but it has been of interest to me uh, personally and professionally my whole life. It's a lifelong Philadelphia and I've, I've always ridden around the site, never to the site. Uh, and so when the fire and explosion happened in the summer of 2019, uh, I wrote a piece in the Enquirer that said, hey, this is time for us to really think about the future of this site. It's 1,400 acres. It's 200 acres bigger than all of Center City. William Penn laid out what is now Center City, Philadelphia in 1682. It took hundreds of years for that property to fill in. It's a vast amount of land. 
uh, and its strategic location, as I'll show you as I go through the presentation between four of the largest job hubs in the city, really makes this uh, something that we should think, consider uh, really carefully in terms of how this ultimately integrates back into the city long term. Uh, we had the, uh, uh, the pleasure of working with Ms. Carol and Alexa and Matt on understanding concerns of the near neighbors. We also met with folks from uh, uh, the Steel Workers Union who were concerned obviously about uh, losing jobs. And as you see, as I go through the presentation, we tried to in a short amount of time, as, as Matt said, come uh, up with really a, a framework of how we might think about this site in the future. We're looking 50, 100, even 150 years in the future, which may frustrate some people. Uh, but if, if we don't put that out now, uh, we'll never get there. So with that, Karina, if you want to um, kind of go through this, we'll go through this pretty quickly because Alexa did a nice job with the timeline and, and Matt's covered a lot of the other uh, kind of environmental issues. But uh, from the uh, mid 1860s up to the present, this has been a site of petrochemical storage, refining and, uh, and distribution. And as we've seen, heavily polluted, heavily uh, kind of uh, toxic, influence on surrounding neighborhoods uh, and um, growing to be the largest refinery on the East Coast. And we've got a couple of images just to show what it looks like through, through, through time. Go ahead, Karen. I love this one because here we are in the kind of mid 1860s to 1870s and this advertisement, which is uh, advertising storage of petroleum products along the Schuylkill Point Breeze makes it look like it's kind of out of, uh, uh, you know, a uh, a Jane Eyre novel. Um, it's, it's, it seems to be bucolic. It looks like it's inviting. There's, the water is, is reflecting the sky. Uh, and it certainly doesn't portend any of the, uh, of the impact that the site has had in the future. Go on. You know, ultimately, this site did become part of Rockefeller's uh, um, uh, oil empire. It was broken up when, this, when the trust was broken up. And, and, and as we've learned before, as we've learned from others, you know, Sunoco ultimately purchased it, but it's got a, a, a significant history kind of in the, that, that coincides with the history of oil refinery in the United States. Uh, and as we know, when it closed, it was the largest refinery on the East Coast. Go ahead. This was a master plan that was developed in 2013 that I talked about that PIDC was looking at the lower Schuylkill. Uh, this encompasses 4,000 acres, and as you can see, the uh, the PES site is, is not quite half of that, but it's a vast area. Just to give you a size comparison, uh, Fairmount Park or East and West Park on the upper part of, of the Schuylkill is 2,000 acres. And that would be the east side from Morrow Hill Cemetery up to the Art Museum, uh, on the west side from the Falls Bridge to, uh, to the zoo, 2,000 acres. Uh, the Wishaken is another 1,800 acres. Both of those were industrial landscapes that in their day were then uh, kind of uh, actually protected, that created a watershed uh, that was protected to, to protect the water supply. So again, imagine this as a 4,000 acre landscape. What are the different um, kind of drivers of, in this case, economic activity around the area that might uh, kind of take this site into the future? So PIDC settled on innovation at the north, which would connect to uh, the kind of catalytic uh, research and uh, that was coming out of University City, particularly in life sciences. Uh, logistics, because of its connection to uh, uh, transportation hubs, the airport, uh, highways, railways, uh, sea, seaways, and then energy, obviously, because of, of the energy use. Uh, so by 2013, that was what PIDC was you know, essentially marketing Philadelphia's industrial uh, landscape to, to outside um, uh, partners. I thought that the lower Schuylkill should look like next. But the explosion upended all that. And it gave us an opportunity to think, what if? Uh, perhaps we don't have to settle with uh, an oil refinery for the next 150 years. And so uh, after the explosion, as I mentioned, we started doing some writing. Uh, the Clean Air Council reached out to us after they had some conversations with the William Penn Foundation uh, on thinking about could we come up with a process that would just begin to ask the questions of what the future of this site might become, recognizing it's incredibly toxic and it's gonna take a long time to develop it, but that the opportunity now was to begin to think uh, about the different systems that should be put in place, what environmentally, socially, and economically, how can this site support the future growth uh, of an equitable Philadelphia? Next slide. 
So Matt did a nice job of kind of giving you a bit of what the process was like. We, we hosted a number of different uh, advisory group meetings. We did a lot of research. Uh, we hosted a number of public meetings and ultimately distilled those conversations down to a set of principles that we used to then uh, inform the work of the design professionals that helped us in the design workshop or the charrette last January. Uh, social justice and equity really um, stood out uh, as, a, as an important guiding principle from the work that we did and the conversations that we had with the, with the community. Obviously, Philly Thrive and their work playing an extremely important role kind of in that sphere. Climate adaptation also being extremely important. The Clean Air Council uh, and, and others, you know, reminding us of sea level rise, storm surge, and the importance of kind of wetlands along the lower Schuylkill and sort of mitigating those uh, potential uh, disasters moving forward. And then what, what might an inclusive growth and prosperity uh, plan for this area look like? If, if communities around the perimeter have been shut out from kind of the economic development or extraction as, as they've called it, that has occurred on this site over uh, the centuries, are there ways to kind of regenerate wealth, to, to build capacity within the local community that actually can create uh, kind of ongoing and sustainable kind of community prosperity uh, for multiple generations? So, so these became ways that the design professionals uh, began to think about the site uh, in terms of the uses, values, and, and ultimately physical form. So next, please. As I mentioned, um, as planners, and I'm an architect and a planner, uh, we look at adjacencies. So in this case, uh, this five mile stretch of river uh, connecting the airport, the Navy Yard, University City and Center City uh, was smack in the middle, is smack in the middle of these four uh, significant job hubs in Philadelphia. And so we began to ask, are there ways to connect uh, physically to, this, to the site that could ultimately help to create kind of social, economic, and environmental connections as well. Uh, some of the, the different colors you see on the, on the uh, image on the left of the slide are, are um, kind of floods and, uh, and sea level rise implications of, um, of the lower Schuylkill. So again, heavily uh, polluted, significant environmental challenges, but an incredible location between uh, these uh, significant job hubs. Go ahead. So the, the designers began to think about um, connections. We began to think about, are there ways to, to, to get over, under, or through the Schuylkill Expressway as it cuts off Point Breeze from the waterfront? Are there street grid connections that kind of come through the site and connect up to different parts of the city, bridges that could take you to the west side? Are there, is there a potential to bring the Schuylkill River Trail down to the, uh, to the mouth of the Schuylkill at Gerard Point that could actually uh, terminate in some kind of you know, public space at the, at the southern terminus? Are there transportation linkages that we can think about? Right now, the, the site is completely isolated. Again, bigger than Center City, and no one really can picture what it's like to be on that site. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a vast site, it can hold many different uses. And we saw Hillco's potential uses as a logistics center, as an as a interesting and, and potentially good first step. But we wanted to make sure that there was a framework in place that the city actually uh, would adopt ultimately, that would create a plan for this site that would allow it to become many different things over time. That we would remediate it to a level that it could kind of withstand residential occupancy. And that say 100 years from now, 50 years from now, there could be neighborhoods, schools, museums, and the like that could uh, kind of find their way into the, into the grid that would, that would come across the site. So connectivity being really important. Next, please. Uh, Matt talked about uh, phasing and that, that the tension between the, the immediate and the urgent and the long-term. And so we tried to, uh, to figure out ways that again, within just sort of the limited amount of time we had to do this work, thinking about what, what might be first steps and then ultimately uh, mid to middle term and then, and then longer term. So uh, organizing some of the uh, developing sort of uh, uh, sites that are on the higher grounds, as you'll see, kind of in some of the areas of the site that have slightly higher elevation and will not be susceptible to, to as, as ra rapidly to sea level rise and and flooding, uh, ultimately perhaps bringing some of the green infrastructure down to the lower Schuylkill and connecting the trails 
at the upper ends of the of the river, and then longer term, uh, kind of perhaps thinking about some uh, gateway opportunities at this site, because as you come across the Platte Bridge from the airport, this is literally the gateway from this city. So we'll, we'll take you through a couple of these uh, kind of ideas quickly, and, and then some best practices that we use to kind of uh, reference as we, as we made some of these uh, images. Go ahead. So as I said, jobs on the higher ground and public access on green infrastructure. We saw um, kind of through a careful reading of the, uh, of the topography by some of the landscape architects and planners that there actually were areas that you could build on now. I mean, yes, there's the, 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 they're polluted and, they're, and they're, they're completely covered over with concrete, uh, but they're out of the floodplain. Uh, and there's a significant amount of uh, area there. So can that be sort of the first, uh, first in, if you will, which would then allow for areas of uh, green infrastructure that could be developed along the perimeter, some of which could be used to, to uh, armor the site from, uh, from flooding and some of it for, for recreation. But we thought it was important given Philadelphia's history of watershed parks and the great trail connections we have in the city that we really uh, give some serious thought to, uh, to green edges, to access to the river, and to uh, water quality. Next, please. Uh, gateway, again, I talked about, you know, for those of us who have lived here, um, uh, the, the, uh, not, I didn't live in the immediate area, but certainly in the city, the, uh, the, the vision of the refinery as you come across the Platte Bridge from the airport was always kind of, you just took it for granted. And now we have an opportunity to really make an, a, an iconic entry. Uh, we can think long term about rebuilding the bridge. It doesn't necessarily have to be uh, 50 to 75 foot in the air for boats to go underneath it. Uh, there's, there's, I think, many opportunities to create uh, civic landscapes here that are kind of nested within kind of the larger site that really begin to tell the story of Philadelphia over time in a way that uh, is much more appealing uh, than, than, than the current view is from, uh, from the South. Next, please. So uh, this was really a way to come up with a, a diagram that's kind of based on some kind of images from successful projects around the world. And I'm not going to go through all of these, but again, there was this tension between wanting drawings. The, the Clean Air Council was really hoping for some uh, kind of images with little kids and balloons and, and Ferris wheels. I, I say that just you know as an idea, not, not that that's what they wanted. Um, but we were also concerned that if you put an image out there, then it becomes um, what people are expecting. So there was a tension between uh, how much detail you go into, how much of this is a framework, and how much of the imagery is really presented through um, case studies of similar types of projects that could be used uh, as to evoke what the future might hold. So from uh, uh, highways that have been uh, kind of turned into boulevards to former uh, steel um, uh, in industrial buildings that have become public spaces to, to, to uh, German uh, munitions factories that have become uh, uh, parks in, in Germany. We'll, we'll go through a few of some of the ideas that we thought were important for people to consider as we move forward. Next, please. Um, Alexa talked about Hilco redevelopment partners. And uh, while we were doing our design shred, literally, I think a, a week or two before uh, Hilco was finally announced as the um, as a successful bidder. We knew that Sparrows Point in Baltimore, which was 3,000 acres, so nearly double or more than double the uh, the Sunoco site, the PES site, uh, was a, an interesting kind of corollary. This was kind of along um, uh, the, the the waterfront in um, in Baltimore, and they were taking a, a long term view of, of repurposing this site for logistics, uh, and we saw this as you know, potentially a positive move in terms of the way Hilco was approaching it. And so we were, um, uh, we, were we were tentatively uh, you know, enthusiastic about the potential for Hilco, while at the same time not wanting the site to necessarily just be com completely covered over with warehouses for kind of Amazon and FedEx and UPS. Next, please. Uh, th these are some drawings that uh, University of Pennsylvania uh, uh, planners and landscape architects did. And I think actually Franco worked on this project uh, for the Rebuild by Design National Design Competition, which was hosted uh, uh, at nationally by HUD. 
after um, uh, Hurricane Sandy up and down the East Coast. So uh, it, it surfaced a, a significant amount of really interesting and innovative ways to deal with uh, sea level rise and industry and, and, and people uh, kind of habit, habitating kind of near areas that were prone to flooding. How might you kind of armor some of the edges and create bikeways? Are there ways for uh, kind of the landscape to actually be constructed in such a way that it would uh, kind of mediate the, the impact? Uh, they're beautiful drawings and they, they, they give us a sense again of what we might think about if we were to develop parts of this site. Next, please. Uh, one of my favorites, um, uh, the, the great uh, Lanshoff Park in Duisburg by um, uh, Peter Latz, a landscape architect. And these were some of the buildings that were, that were bombed out kind of at the end of World War II. They were uh, part of the kind of Nazi kind of industrial complex, extremely obviously significant landscapes with, with lots of scars uh, physically and emotionally, becoming a park as part of the healing process uh, and, and not necessarily um, kind of uh, uh, sanitizing and, rub and, and, and destroying the imagery, but using it as an evocative way uh, to, um, to, to center the, uh, the landscape in, in the 21st century. So I, I think that's it for my presentation. Let's see, yeah. And let's uh, maybe go to the questions and then open it up to the panel. Excellent, thank you. Yes, many questions have been streaming in. Um, and I've given Franco the very challenging task of figuring out which one of these will be good for the broader Q&A, but I'm just gonna pull out a couple that we can answer now. Um, so could you talk a little bit about um, the charrette and if Hilco is, like, is on board with some of the ideas being proposed in the charrette? Um, it, it, just reading from this, uh, um, this comment, which might've come in before your presentation, but um, they say it seems like a great opportunity to create access to the river and an area for active and passive recreation. Um, so, so could you just talk a little bit about sure. Hillco's response to the charrette process? Yeah, so um, as I mentioned, Hillco was really not on, in Philadelphia when we did the charrette and then COVID shut us down. So as Matt said, we all, you know, there are great plans to kind of roll this out in, in March kind of were scuttled, but, um, we have met with Hilco since they've arrived, and uh, they have expressed interest in the in the work. Uh, they they have a a small crew on the ground. I think many of folks have probably met Jasmine Sessoms, who's the kind of corporate uh, liaison uh, vice president. So we've been talking to her. We've met a number of her colleagues uh, who have um, who have seen this work and have expressed interest. You know what that means and how far they'll go is anybody's guess. Uh, but, I, but it has at least uh, gotten their attention. And I think there, there is interest in, in seeing how some of these ideals or ideas might find their way into their planning. But it's, I think it's too early in the process. They have about a two year um, time horizon to actually shut the, uh, an active refinery down at the same time while they're trying to do some planning and ultimately get some buildings uh, um, kind of up and running um, in, in certain parts of the site. So it's, a, it, it's, it's difficult for me to say exactly what they're going to be doing, but they have expressed interest. And and do you know if they're um, well? Actually, if you could speak to who funded this study that you did, and if there are future studies um, that are being planned, or if it, now it's in in Hil Hilco's hands, and if there will be studies um, on Hilco's side. So uh, this study was funded, as as Matt said, by the William Penn Foundation. Uh, Matt had been uh, talking with the William Penn Foundation about kind of the remediation process. We had been talking to them about kind of doing some visioning because I did uh, the, the uh, Central Delaware with the William Penn Foundation in 2006 to 2007. Uh, and there was an opportunity for, for us to partner with the Clean Air Council. And like Matt said, it was done kind of very quickly. I don't know of any other studies at that scale that are going on right now, I'm sure. So for instance, um, there was a there's a competition in Philadelphia called the Ed Bacon competition. Ed Bacon being the legendary city planner who helped revitalize Philadelphia after World War II. They host an international design competition each year. They use this site for that competition. So it's, it's going to be, I think, in the public eye for a long time. It is so, uh, so interesting, so difficult, so challenging. Uh, so so I, I'm sure at the University of Pennsylvania, there are design studios that are being uh, done on this site, but I, I have not yet come across anyone trying to kind of elevate it to the level of the public conversation that we're, uh, that, that we're hosting. 
Uh, the, the Enquirer has always been a partner in a lot of the work that we've done. And up till now, they've, they've expressed a lot of interest in this site as well. Uh, uh, Joe Minot, who is um, uh, Matt's boss, actually has an a, a excellent op-ed in the paper today about uh, the environmental remediation, contamination, and, and uh, Evergreen's uh, requirements and, and, and trying to rally troops to, to, to write comments. So uh, as far as I know, this is kind of uh, what's been done. I'm not sure what, what's, what's being done. Mm. Okay. Excellent. Thank you. I think we'll, we'll, we have many more questions, but let's um, pass the floor off to Philly Thrive for a few minutes and then we'll do an open Q&A with all of the panelists. So um, thank you, Harris, Alexa, and Carol, if you want to hop back on um, for some, for some closing perspectives, I pass the floor on to you. Sure thing. Thank you. Thanks everybody for those presentations. Um, looks like Ms. Carol's coming back on. Um, yeah, so we're just gonna, we wanted to conclude with sharing a little bit about um, the Right to Thrive campaign, which is Philly Thrive's campaign around the redevelopment of the, of the refinery land. Um, and we wanted to start with actually uh, a video, a little highlight reel of the organizing, just to reground. I mean, we need everyone in this movement. We need everyone to transform this massive site to be to fulfill its potential, to undo the harm that was done for a century and a half. We need everybody, including the very, very intellectually rigorous folks like Matt and Harris. And we also need to remind ourselves that people power, supporting communities who live around the refinery site, using direct action, using art will be key strategies, just as key as, as the intellectual pursuits that are gonna help us achieve the goal. So we were just gonna play a little highlight reel of organizing that to remind ourselves of, of key strategies that led to the refinery's closure that we'll need to keep using and advocating for, for the site. Um, so without further ado. So just wanted to share that with you all. Um, oops, don't want to see it again. Um, here we go. So Ms. Carol, do you want to talk at all about kind of what you're hoping to see for the future of the land, what you're hoping, you know, we're able to accomplish with this Right to Thrive campaign? Um, yes, I would like to say, um, as far as for the future for our, for our youth and the future for our children, um, and to know it's gonna be a short-term, long-term goal, but to see how the environment was, uh, the environmental justice march and anything else we have to do, if we're gonna to continue to do that, we can continue to fight because it's a long time thing that's coming. Um, I, still, I still smell oils. I still smell odors and stuff right outside my door, even to this day. And I know it's gonna take time to clean the, the area up, but we still have people getting sick out here. You know, we still have it. I had a bad, very, very bad uh, time with the explosion and 
I still have eye irritations. I have asthma now, you know. I, I deal with the, uh, the residents that's closer to me with the high rise with the senior citizens and they don't have no air, uh, central air in their building. So the future for them is gonna be hard. Um, they, when the, when the air still blows, it goes into their windows from the, any, anywhere from the 12th, 12th, 12th on, on down. They smell these still smelling odors that's coming into their apartments. Um, the future, I would love to see more jobs. I would love to see a, clean, a very good cleanup. Um, I would like to see a park area where we could come out of Wilson Park for a change and have another park where everybody can come together, not just Wilson Park or uh, any surrounding other communities, but just to have a place where our seniors can go sit, our, our children can go and play. Um, we, we need more of that with, the, with more trees, definitely, definitely more trees where we can sit back and, and go to cookouts and picnics and and just different things that could bring the community together again, because we are very separated right now. And with this COVID-19, hope that also give us a chance to come back to reality and to reach out to one another and stay together. That's right. Yes. That's right. Awesome. Yeah, so we hope you'll join us in this campaign. We just cannot forget. I mean, it's that it's exciting the opportunity that that Philly has and that all of our organizations, wherever we're located, you know, very excited about the ideas for the site. And we cannot, cannot lose the history of of the harm the refinery did, um, the racism, the classism that allowed it to operate for as long as it did, totally unchecked. And we have to make sure that the jobs, the investment, the cleanup, everything benefits residents in the surrounding neighborhoods first and foremost. Um, and that will take everyone to advocate for that. Um, you know, and including residents at the center of decision making. Um, so ways you can join us in the Right to Thrive campaign, you, you have until tomorrow to submit a comment on the refinery cleanup in this current comment period. We'll drop the link in the chat. You can also type in that bit.ly link into your browser. Uh, Thrive has a form set up that takes like 30 seconds to, to submit a comment on the refinery cleanup. You do not have to be an expert. It's very easy. We've laid it all out. You can join Philly Thrive as a member. We have new member orientation every month, including um, Wednesday the 20th. You can donate to Thrive at phillythrive.org and follow us on Facebook and sign up on our website um, for updates so you can you know, stay informed about the action that we are asking folks to take. And we can drop those links in the chat. Um, yeah, I think that's all we, we wanted to close with. Thanks, Thank everyone. Thank you both. If you want to keep your cameras on, and uh, I see Franco's on already, so he's going to get us through some more Q&A. Harris and Matt, you're welcome to come back as well. Great. Thank you. Thanks all. These were amazing presentations. We covered so much ground. Um, and there are a lot of questions, so it's, it's, uh, it's a little challenging to put them together, but what I did is put them into a couple of groups. Um, so maybe what I'll do is just sort of put together a couple of comments in each category and then just put them out there for you all to reply to. So the first category is some people expressing interest about in knowing the current condition. So is the site currently safe? In other words, as obviously Ms. Ms. Carroll said, she's you know still, still smell things, but is the site actively maintained by anyone? Is it secure? Um, what 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 is the what is the active uh, conditions of the site and 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 to what extent should people be concerned in this period of remediation that the uh, the sort of impacts are still there? So I know you addressed some of it, but do you want to talk any about any specifics about how the site's being maintained right now? Who wants to take Carol, do you want to do you want to start or or should I? Go ahead. Um, well, Hilco, you know, Hilco is the, the current owner, so they, they would be responsible for securing the site. Um, and in response to someone's question in the chat, uh, they're also, since they now own TES, technically, they're also responsible for any other cleanup that might need to be done if there's contamination past 2012, which is when uh, TES bought the refinery from Sunoco. Um, so they're, you know, they are um, right now, you know, in charge of the site. And in charge of decommissioning, uh, for what I understand, they're they're going to be decommissioning the infrastructure at the site, um, and they're they're looking at sort of getting uh, their permitting and everything like that in place right now. Okay, and I also want to mention that um, when I'm coming across the airport bridge, 
uh, I took, I actually made a video of, I see trucks still going on there, going on the property without, uh, it's, it's actually blank, blank trucks now. Before he used to have names on the trucks, now there's blank trucks going in and out of there. And then now I see more smoke than I did like two months ago. So I don't know if there's a cleanup up process that they have to have that going on to clean it up, the site up, but we need people to go out to investigate and make sure that's all that's going on. Mm -hmm. Because uh, at the back of the refinery from PES, yes, it's a small refinery back there and they're still operating. So when do we cop, like, try to go out there and find out, is that a part of um, the, the new refinery or be the new cleanup or they can still operate and then he'll go just take the front part of the refinery. Because there's another refinery back there in the, in the mm -hmm. In, in the back section of the uh, airport section. Yeah, I think what Ms. Carroll's pointing to is something Philly Thrive's really trying to pursue right now, which is just more regular public meetings, a more thorough system for keeping the public updated on work happening in an ongoing way um, because there's we, we've been contacted by you know former PES employees saying we're concerned about if Hilco has the capacity to really safely decommission the site so we think a big answer to that question because it, it there's going to be questions at every stage of this process around are we safe um, mm -hmm. and we deserve through what folks have been through we deserve to know that and I think uh, we'd love to partner with Hilco in getting a public you know, public communication system up and running that meets residents' needs around hearing that we're safe and getting actual answers for how the site is being handled, you know, week to week, month to month. Hey, thank you. Um, I have a sort of shift to some scientific questions. Um, there are folks who, who are asking if, um, if the PFAS were, were never actually studied, um, you know, how do you know how pervasive the, the, the problem is? And then a second question, the discussion about potential aquifer impacts in New Jersey, um, you know, if they haven't been studied, is it modeling that's been done? Is there, you know, is, are, are there samples that have been conducted or how do you know, um, how do you know the extent of, of these pollutants that haven't been adequately studied? I'm sorry, I got you, I'm trying to know that. I think those to me. So on PFAS, uh, when I noted they're uh, pervasive in the environment, they stay in the environment for a long time. That's in general, uh, not specifically that we know they are at the site. Uh, we are we are concerned that they might be at the site because of the, the history of fires uh, at the site and the, the fact that PFAS chemicals are, are found in firefighting foams. Uh, so we're, we're asking that you know, that investigation be done and include PFAS. Uh, there, there hasn't been any investigation, so we actually don't have any idea uh, how much PFAS might be at the site or not. And how about the, the groundwater contamination in New Jersey? Yeah, so to our knowledge, uh, Evergreen hasn't done any um, sampling of the deep aquifer in New Jersey to see if it's contaminated. And, and they're also uh, pushing off some modeling and, and further analysis of uh, potential risks to drinking water um, to, to a, a later report at the end of this year that they plan to put out for public comment. So they're not addressing, I mean, really they had seven years, I believe, to address this uh, when DEP first raised it. Um, ideally, that would have been part of the current comment period that we're in right now. Unfortunately, uh, they're, they're uh, trying to delay that. Uh, so we're, we might have to wait on that analysis. So then to follow up on that, there were some, um, some, some legal questions about how far Evergreen's responsibility goes. So let's say that at some point there is evidence of contamination offsite out of the, the, the you know, beyond the boundary of the property that, that Hilco purchased. Um, you know, what, what's the spatial scale at which Evergreen is responsible legally for remediating? So I'll be the first to say I'm not an attorney or an engineer for that matter. Um, but but uh, my understanding is that they they would be if it's if it can be demonstrated that the the pollution came from the PES refinery site, mm -hmm. uh, then uh, then Evergreen should be responsible for cleaning it up. Uh, there has been some um, some questions around some offsite pollution in the past mm -hmm. where there, there's not enough evidence to show. Uh, that that's you know that came from the Sunoco uh, uh, refinery because there were other um, sources of potential contaminants nearby. 
uh, that where it actually appeared to be uh, coming from. So that's that's my again non legal uh, <laughs> uh, take on this is that they they would be responsible if evidence um, and facts are presented that show that they uh, that it did come from the site. So two other sort of following up on these few other legal questions. I mean, is there coordination between the remediation of this site and some of the Superfund activities going on in Eastwick and um, and also there was a question about the act to site specific standard and whether you know whether it has been completely problematic in this context or whether if applied correctly it can um, you know you all think that it can lead to some positive outcomes that was a, a question posed early on yeah let me start by saying um, I can I can follow up on that question around off-site with one of our attorneys and see um, if the person who asked the question wants to follow with me directly um, to ask that, then I'll, I'll have your contact information and get that, uh, confirm that response for you. Uh, and on the, um, the site-specific standard question, yeah, in this instance, it's definitely problematic because Evergreen, you know, is proposing a standard twice what the state has for their, their health based standard. Um, could there be a situation that it, that it would be, um, you know, an appropriate standard uh, in some other context, uh, possibly? Um, but we're, you know, sort of looking at this, um, at this site right now and, and, and do not think um, it is appropriate. Then that coordination question with other, you know, for example, stuff going on on the other side of the river, is there, is there coordination going on or like sort of thinking about remediation of the entire area of Southwest Philadelphia or are these projects, you know, being sort of studied individually? I don't know the answer to that question. Um, I, and my guess would be there's probably not too much coordination going on. Okay, so I'll move on to some other questions that were um, more on the visioning side and in particular whether, you know, obviously Hillco purchased or owns the property now, but um, is, there any, is there any possibility for a public park appearing there? Has the city parks and rec expressed any, any interest in some portion of the site becoming a public park. And then also the question about wetlands, um, you know, is there, to what extent do sort of regulations or vision um, suggest that we might see more wetlands go there as they were historically before development? Mm -hmm. Okay. You want me to take that? Uh, so, you know, I think with, with the pandemic, the city has been otherwise engaged. So this has not been, at least from my perspective, sort of top of mind, uh, at least in terms of uh, um, uh, kind of city government. Hilco has been going through um, entitlement period, trying to get zoning for the site that would allow them to, um, uh, to, to put a number of different uses on the site. And I think that it's been more challenging than they've thought kind of, um, and maybe what they've experienced in other cities. But mm -hmm. from what I've heard, uh, there, there, there's not been any, um, any conversation that I'm aware of coming from the city, now that doesn't mean there haven't been, but um, it's certainly, um, from my perspective, is a prime opportunity for the city to add knowledge to the park system, to extend the trails. And we think of, when we think about stimulus money that's gonna be coming from the new Biden administration, uh, what better way to kind of think about kind of investing in the future of the city than perhaps uh, kind of green infrastructure along the lower school coast. So uh, mm -hmm. I, would, I would stay tuned in terms of kind of that, that question. Uh, and the second one was what, Franco? Um, so wetlands. Uh, same, same thing. I mean, again, we felt certainly at the, the shred and then the, the folks who participated that the need for wetlands at the lower school call, you know, was significant and that there, there was a significant amount of land that could be used for that on the PES site while still having a significant amount of development. I think it's going to ultimately come down to Hilco's interest in sort of balancing, you know, capitalism and, and public good. And I'm not quite sure where they're gonna come down on, on that side. They, I think the public does have a couple of levers that they can push or pull. Uh, the, the Hilco successfully lobbied for the extension of the KOZ, the Keystone Opportunity Zone, uh, kind of tax status for the site, which means there's public money uh, that's, already, that's going into the development of the site. Uh, and it's, and that, that may be a, a leverage for public access. Um, so I think the other piece of it is, is zoning and land use. The, the city 
uh, has the has the right to not only determine kind of zoning on the site, but they could okay. also they can also determine the the streets and the and the shape of uh, what what we call the city plat or the plan for the site. Those are two very powerful tools that the city has that they haven't really exercised in a long time. And this site could be an area for the city to sort of take a, a proactive interest in, both of which would then, I think, take into account a lot of the issues we've talked about today. But without those, it's really he'll go kind of on their own. Mm. And I'll just add that I think one, one immediate kind of tool that we have as, as the public and as residents um, around whether what decision Hilco ultimately makes around uh, you know capitalism or public good is Thank the you. community benefits agreement that Hilco um, will need to negotiate with the surrounding community groups um, and so the uh, the community groups are in, you know, are in position and there's a coalition forming actually as we speak of South and Southwest organizations to get on one accord to decide um, of, you know, benefits that, that surrounding communities want to negotiate from Hilco is green space on the site part of those. And so this is yet another opportunity and another kind of avenue where, where all, all organizations across the city kind of getting behind and, and continuing to advocate for community groups being at the center of decision making, I think will ultimately serve us all and serve, you know, these environmental goals that we have or, or goals that, yeah, will benefit residents broadly. Um, so just, yeah, just wanted to point to that tool as one, one entry point we have for negotiating with Hilco. Great, thank you. And I mean, while you're on that point, I, I wonder, you know, since this is part of this environmental justice uh, mini series that we're talking about, if the folks from Philly Thrive want to talk about sort of the trajectory that you're on. I mean, obviously, you've been really active in this site and you're you just mentioned, Alexa, that you're, you know, talking to other groups. But how about citywide? I mean, is is do you see, you know, thinking of like 10 years ago and 10 years from now, can you kind of give us a feeling of like, how you see the environmental justice movement uh, changing, evolving, you know, starting here, but you know, what, what is the vision for, for networking and coordination at, uh, at larger scales? Ms. Carol, you wanna start? You can, sweetie. I just, want, I just wanna say, as long as we can have um, decision-making in it and also have someone to go out there and to like investigate you know, to make sure that they're doing all the proper things they're supposed to do. So mm -hmm. it's it gotta be a, a piece of it. We have to have a piece of, the, of that to have, to justify what they're doing, how they're doing it and how long it's gonna take, so. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, you know, Philly Thrive is, a, I think, a really fascinating organization and I don't know many, you know, like, what we've built because we are rooted and based in Gray's Ferry and the surrounding neighborhoods, the PS site, but we are a citywide organization. I live in Cobbs Creek. Um, we have folks all across the city kind of gathering together to back this specific constituency and their leadership development. Um, and so I think um, we are seeing expansion, even more members both in Gray's Ferry come in and thrive and across Philadelphia. And so I'm very curious about where our organization will head um, in the future, I think, as we build more members across the city, one direction we're really all, have been building in during during COVID um, has been developing out our, our policy apparatus and developing out our members' skills and abilities to actually generate policy uh, that we, we understand is under the umbrella of a green recovery from COVID-19, right? That addresses the pandemic and the root causes there, climate change and the extractive racist economy that we have. And so Thrive members have been digging into policy ideas that would address, the, address those interlocking crises that would really um, be taking a bite out of citywide um, kind of uh, policy and, and ways to improve the city for us all on those various fronts. I think, you know, where I'm really inspired about the environmental justice movement in Philly um, really expanding and deepening is around uh, food justice and land justice. There are, you know, Black farmers across Philadelphia who are 
you know, growing in numbers and resources and support to, to be gardening on like growing food on land and deepening kind of food sovereignty work in Philadelphia, um, which I think is going to be really, really key in the future, especially as climate impacts worsen, we need to be growing much more food locally. And there are Black Philadelphians leading that work in the city more and more, and we need to look to them for the, you know, solutions to the climate crisis. Um, but yeah, I think there's there's different projects that are beginning to, um, I think Eastwick is another key environmental justice community that's been on the front lines of the climate crisis in Philly for a long time and doing really nitty gritty work um, dealing with the EPA and other agencies. Um, and so I think, I think, yeah, and, and to have also council members, city council members like Kendra Brooks in office now that, that are really poised to talk about a Green New Deal in Philadelphia and how to even begin to ready ourselves to intercept funding that could come through on the federal level as Biden gets into office. Um, so those are the different pieces, I think, from having more political allies in the city level and the state level, um, and then different pieces of the environmental justice movement in Philly connecting around, um, you know, flooding issues in Eastwick to food growing yeah. all across the city. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think those are some of the, the pieces that I'm seeing. Yeah, yeah, there you go. Thank you. And I think yeah. one of the silver linings of, you know, the COVID pandemic, as well as the civil unrest this summer is that people are much more aware now of the impact. I and mean, when you saw how, you know, Greenhouse glass emission went down, what was it, by 70%? I forget the numbers. Uh, extraordinary kind of impact that just us not moving around had on the environment. And then the, um, you know, the, the, the absolutely gut-wrenching um, kind of uh, um, murder of George Floyd and the, and the civil unrest that followed have, I think, made people aware that this, is, this isn't going to go away. This is yeah. real. I, yeah. I was... Um, Fortunate to be, I had a, a group of students I was working with in our urban strategy program and we were working on this site just as all of that was coming to a head. And the, and the students kind of grabbed the mantle of environmental justice to kind of frame the way to think about the site moving forward. So I think there's a lot of momentum right now for the movement uh, and that, uh, you know, it's incumbent obviously on every one of us in our different ways to kind of keep it going, but it's hard to imagine us going back to a kind of pre-COVID, pre-George Floyd uh, kind of way of thinking about the world. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we had a attendee with uh, their hand raised, but um, that person uh, just dropped out. So uh, my next question kind of got ripped out from under me, but we only have a couple of minutes left. I wonder if anyone uh, wants to sort of make any closing statements, um, you know, just, uh, just to kind of close this out. It's been a really amazing session. I think you know, having this combination of speakers talking about this site from all these different perspectives, historical, scientific, you know, planning, uh, legal, has been really, really spectacular. Um, but if any of you have any sort of like final, anyone want to sort of close it out? I don't want to close it out, but I'll just put one final plug in to make sure uh, you comment on the remediation on these investigations we talked about today. Uh, tomorrow's the last day. Again, you can go to our website cleanair.org uh, slash Philly Refinery. Uh, so just one last plug, but someone else should close this out. And I would just encourage everybody to keep the public conversation going about public yeah. access to the river. That yes. the, um, that's it's gonna be critically important moving forward. I don't think we can expect Hilco to do it on their own. It's gotta be a public yes. partnership, but yes. it's, it's incredibly valuable. Look at the gift we have from previous generations of Fairmount Park just a couple of miles to the north. Yes. There's no reason we can't do it again. That's so true. And, um, and so much, you know, the, the, please come in and join us for the next two uh, months of this mini session or mini series to talk about environmental justice in other cities, because not only does the coordination have to happen within one city, but across, mm -hmm. across cities. Mm -hmm. I've spent a lot of work working with environmental justice groups in the Bronx. And, you know, there's a lot of lessons to be learned and information to be transferred. So please join us for uh, the next two sessions. And with that, I, I just want to thank everyone for dedicating this time to this important topic. And, um, and let's continue talking. Thank you for hosting. It's thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks to everyone.